to a Blood and Pigment Battle Report. We're going to play the historical scenario, the Great Swamp Fight from the Fire on the Frontier expansion. This uh, has, I'm going to play the uh, Native Americans, the Narragansetts, uh, defending a fort in a frozen swamp, and Guy's going to be attacking. I'm going to be attacking with the New England Militia. Under me old Josiah Winslow? Yes. <laughs> I fell in a hidden fortress in the middle of the Great Swamp, and I'm raiding it at 3 a.m. <laughs> um, yeah, so you have a lot more units than me, um, but I have this fort, so we'll see if, well, how it ends up. Yeah, and there's a weakness in your defenses in the center. I'm going to see if I can storm across it with my models oh, and no. hopefully get to the, uh, force you back to your blockhouse. Yeah, I got some good defenses. I hope they hold up for me. We'll have to see. Good luck. The Great Swamp Fight is one of the most dramatic engagements of King Philip's War, but before we play it out in Blood and Plunder, let's quickly review the history behind this battle. By 1675, the relationship between the New England colonies and the local native tribes had been souring for years. As the colonies grew, they lost the respect they once had for the Wampanoag, Narragansetts, Nipmuc, and Abenakis and other local tribes. Being more self-sufficient and in need of more and more land, colonies increasingly saw the native tribes as obstacles and subjects instead of friends and allies. Seeing no end to the slights and injustices coming from the colonies, the great sachem of the Wampanoag, Metacomet, who took on the English name of King Philip, slowly organized a loose alliance of tribes willing to fight back against the New Englanders. By June of 1675, Wampanoag war parties began raiding and burning small settlements, and the colonies mobilized their militias and went to war. Some native tribes and towns allied with the English, but most either joined King Philip's alliance or, like the Narragansetts, attempted to remain neutral. By the winter of 1675, the powerful Narragansett tribe had still not taken sides, but they had taken in Wampanoag refugees and had refused to meet the colonial governor's demands to hand them over. Seeing this partiality to their enemies, along with signs of preparing for war, the colonies decided to attack the Narragansetts. The winter is not an ideal for a major attack into the wooded wilderness, but Connecticut, New Plymouth, and Massachusetts cooperated to assemble an army of about 1,000 militia, accompanied by at least 150 Mohegan allies. With a captured Indian guide, the entire force led by Governor Josiah Winslow set out to attack the fortified Narragansett town, on December 19th. The Narragansetts, led by Kenanchet, had set up a large town in the Great Swamp in southern Rhode Island. Besides the natural defense of the surrounding swamp, the Narragansetts had fortified their town with a tall palisade wall, a deep ditch before the wall, and strategically placed blockhouses to shoot from. The entrance to the fort was a narrow bridge of a huge fallen tree across the surrounding ditch. After a long march through the frozen swamp and some small-scale skirmishing with Narragansett scouts, the English discovered the town and quickly attempted to assault the main gate in the early afternoon. The Narragansett defenses proved effective and the English were forced to fall back with several casualties, including officers. Indian Peter, the colonist's guide, pointed out a weak point in the defenses where the palisade was unfinished and a large log lay across a gap in the wall. The New Englanders redeployed, but the first assault was again beaten back by fierce defensive fire. But the second charge broke through, and the New Englanders poured into the stockade. A murderous melee followed, leaving 70 militia and over 100 warriors dead and many more wounded. As the evening grew late, Cannon Chet escaped with most of the warriors, but many of the women, children, and elderly Narragansetts were killed as Governor Winslow ordered the well-provisioned town to be burned. The exhausted but victorious New Englanders carried their many wounded back through the bitterly cold swamp through the night. They had struck a powerful blow against the Narragansetts, destroying both great stores of food, many dwellings, and the stronghold, and killing many warriors and non-combatants. But the colonies had also strained their treasuries to create this army and turned the Narragansetts into bitter enemies and failed to kill or capture Cannon Chet or any of the other chiefs. Cannon Chet would go on to counterattack, leading several bloody raids against villages in the spring of 1676 until he was eventually captured and killed in April. King Philip's war would continue into the summer until King Philip was also ambushed and killed on August 12th. 
We have the battle board set up and we're ready to begin. We're using the historical forces given in the scenario, but before we start, each player will discuss their opening strategy. Hello, I'm Guy from Blood and Pigment, and I'll be leading the English militia today, led by Josiah Winslow on the attack on a hidden fortress. I My force is 50% English militia, which is a unit that I hate completely uh, because they have terrible stats. So my plan is to position as many of them as I can in the field of fire of the units he has, either on the cl palisade close to the center or the breastworks, and concentrate fire. English militia are going to die by droves because they have a terrible save and they're up against Native Americans that have a good save and hard cover. So uh, that is my plan for the English militia. The other half are kind of uh, tricky special forces. I have Braves, Young Braves, and Indian Fighters. So I'm probably going to send them to one of the flanks to see if I can distract shot and jump over and start eliminating the Palisade from one end. Just going to the center and sowing, sowing a little bit of chaos. I'm Joseph and I'm going to take on the part of the Native Americans here. These are the Narragansetts led by Ken Onchette. Um, I'm in a fortified position, but I have almost, just barely more than half the troops that the English attackers have. So I have some good uh, fatigue management, um, but not a lot of uh, firepower. So if I can not die, I think I can hold on for a while if I can mow as many English down as they cross the uh, open space between the forest and the palisade walls. I might be able to even the odds a bit. I have a blockhouse, which is very strong and defensible, but I don't want to start there. So I'm worried about running back and getting in the blockhouse. I'm not sure if I can make good use of that or not, but I'll start my, I have two units of civilians, which are just dead weight, but I have to protect them because I get strike points if they die. So I'll start with them in the blockhouse, hope they survive there. Hope I can fall back to that if my first line of defense fails. My commander has resilient and Vendetta English, he hates the English, and he has uh, Castilian, which means I get a minus one bonus on all my re uh, rally results. So like I said, I'm not going anywhere as long as I don't die. So I'm just trying to hope, uh, use my fortune to re-roll any poor saves so my men stay alive and see how many English I can take down and see if I can just shoot them all down as they come to me. We'll see how it goes. We set up the scenario using the suggested historical forces as the Narragansett option of the New England tribes. The native forces are required to arm all units with thrown weapons. That might come back as important later in the battle. All units gain the skirmishers rule, and I'm able to downgrade Nias's to train for minus one point each. I deploy my four fighting units along the wall with the command unit of Braves near the center, and then deploy the two units of civilians within the buildings. As the New England militia, all English units in Guy's force gain the tough special rule, so they will shed fatigue faster than usual. Josiah Winslow, his commander, has a huge command range, a vendetta against natives, and the strict special rule. The English set up their six units at the edge of the tree line, which is about 11 inches from the native fort. The game is ready to begin. Over the course of the first turn, the English attempt to soften up the native defenses, firing volleys from the cover of the trees, eventually killing two models in the native command unit of Braves. The natives fire back, doing little damage, but sending one of the units of English militia back, shaken with three fatigue. Led by the officer character, the unit of Indian fighters moves forward on the English left flank, looking to lead the assault on the Indian fortification. Going into round two, Guy draws two events. Smoke shrouds the battlefield, giving a penalty to ranged attack coming from any unit that has a reload marker, which is pretty much all units with muskets. The English take initiative on turn two, and the Indian fighters charge. Climbing over the wall is dedicated action, but with the officer, they are able to move up, then charge over, catching the Nyases with two fatigues. So they're unable to make a defensive attack. Three of the six Nyases are killed, and they fall back, shaken. It's only turn two, and the fort is already breached. 
The Narragansett's countercharge with the young Braves, but the superior English fight save comes through, and the Indian fighters are not driven back. The assault ramps up, with a large unit of English militia driving straight through the center. With the lingering smoke, the native half-defensive fire is ineffective, and the English militia charge pushing Cannon Shet back. But again, the natives are able to countercharge from the flank. Cannon Shet rallies his men and wipes out the entire unit of militia. Near the end of t turn two, the native civilians, seeing their braves hard-pressed at the wall, rush out of the longhouse to aid in the defense. In spite of their terrible stats, they hit the Indian fighters in the wall hard, and this time their saves fail, and they are eliminated. A lot has happened by the end of turn two. Let's see how Kenichet and Governor Winslow are feeling about the battle. So at the start of turn three, things are not looking as well as they could be for the English. I've lost a lot of men the last two turns. I'm what did breach the wall, but I was unable to maintain the foothold as civilians with thrown weapons charged out of a wigwam and took out Benjamin Church, possibly changing the course of history. The My unit of eight, uh, eight English militia lost to six young warriors as well, or warriors. That's why they lost. These are warriors. Warriors are Malay beasts. So it's the problem we, that I've had is I haven't uh, had everybody move up because uh, in my experience, when you have the initial charge, it doesn't hold. Uh, if everybody is there, then they just kind of counter charge and wipe all your guys out. So I held them back a little bit, uh, but it's not looking. I have a couple of charges and, and uh, attacks set up. But it's not looking like I'm in the best situation right now. I do have a lot of his, a lot of his units are panicked, and I have units ready to charge over with this initiative or a command point or an activation. I also have a unit that is covering another unit, so I can get somebody up close uh, to really take advantage of it. The last turn's events hurt me a lot because none of my unit's muskets could do anything effectively. They're I had uh, the smoke on the battlefield made it so I got a plus one, and English are not a good shot to begin with, so they were shoot a base shoot of eight. <laughs> so we're going to see if this turn I can get through there and and hopefully even the odds a little bit. Well, we got to the end of the second turn, and a lot has happened. The um, English breached my wall on beginning of turn one or turn two and had a hard time of it but two big units jumped over the wall but I was able to barely uh, push them back but now all my units are all scattered away from the breastworks and the uh, palisade and he has more fresh units coming so I'm happy to survive the first rush but I'm worried about the second rush here I had a dramatic moment where the civilians rushed out of the longhouse and Countercharged Benjamin Church's unit and wiped them out, which was very gratifying. But now I got Indians, English Indians, right outside the Palisade Wall about to attack my poor civilians who are have too fatigue and are in hopeless mess. Um, Cannon Chase, Sheth's unit has been beat up pretty badly, so I haven't got as much value out of him as I wish. So let's we'll see if we. I've lost quite a few models, but I wiped out two English units which evens the playing field a little bit. <clears throat> so I have to see if I can um, work through this turn here, see if I can actually make some attacks around all the fatigue I have. So middle of turn two, I was in despair, but end of turn two, it seems like I have maybe a chance, but it hasn't been easy. I lose the initiative bid by the smallest of margins going into turn three, and the English Indian allies charge over the wall attacking the civilians who recently took out the Indian fighters. The civilians miraculously survive only much better saves and fatigue checks than they should. In the center, my native units, including my command unit, are heavily fatigued and have to spend most of the turn rallying, giving the rest of the English force a good opportunity to move forward towards the gap in the wall. The Nyasis also charge into the Braves, trying to drop, drive them back, but they remained in melee combat. Stakes are high going into turn four.
In turn four, the fighting gets desperate and personal. Josiah Winslow leads his large unit of militia through the gap and charges Cannon Shep. Using a command point to make the militia fight a second time, Winslow's militia destroys Cannon Shep's unit and kills him, as I have no fortune left to cheat death. Things are looking pretty bad for the natives. But my young braves are able to countercharge and throw in weapons are punishing. Winslow falls back with six fatigue. His unit is almost eliminated. At the end of turn four, we both have two strike points with over 50% casualties. Let's check in with the commanders again at the end of turn four. So things have gone a little bit better for the English. I've now advanced up the center of the board. I have uh, paid for this, this ground in blood, but I'm now in the position where if my commander doesn't die, I can do something. Uh, the two of my three English units, English militia units, are completely dead, and one of my other units are very close. My last command unit is very close to dead, but they engaged with the native commander uh, in sword, sword to sword, and won, and walked away from it uh, bleeding but victorious. So now I'm going to see if this turn and the next, I can uh, finish it and drive the Native Americans to ground. So into turn four, and my commander is dead. It's pretty rough. His commander has six fatigue on it, so the draw uh, initiative on this turn is pretty much probably going to decide the game. If I can get one more fight and charge his command unit and wipe that out, that will at least give me a fighting chance. But my civilians have been played a significant part. They've been quite resilient. It's incredible. <laughs> we both have two strike points right now. Both of our forces are down more than 50%. Uh, it's been a desperate struggle, but this fighting is still right at the uh, Palisade line. The blockhouse has played no part in this, which has been a bit disappointing. But yeah, we're going to draw our opening hands. I get two cards. He gets three. The guy has already drawn a lot of spades, so I'm banking on that. Up to this point, things have been tightly balanced. Now the situation begins to fall apart for the English. In what seems like a good start, the English commander removes all his fatigue in one rally attempt, but the natives fight savagely for their homes, knocking out one unit after another. The only units left in the English force at the end of the turn are the two native units, which are both shaken. At the end of turn 5, we tally strike points. Narragansetts have lost 22 of their 39 models, giving them two strike points. The English have lost 42 of their 48 models, giving them three strike points. And then, since they lost the local guide, the hostage advi advisor character, they have gained a fourth strike point. Since the English have two more strike points than the Narragansetts, and with no commander to take a strike test, the game ends in a native victory. History has been rewritten. Let's talk one more time with the commanders at the battle's end. So now that the battle has happened and you've seen all the carnage, let's do an after battle report. Again, I'm Guy. I'm Joseph. This was a bloodbath. Like 75% like casualties on both sides? 75% <laughs> casualties. More than 75% for the English. It was uh, a desperate struggle. <laughs> all the English men are dead. <laughs> There's the a couple game. Indians, Indian allies left, but yeah. It's all of them are all fleeing. English militia, Benjamin Church, Josiah uh, Winslow, and the Indian fighters were all dead. Yeah, uh, it was not good. I think it it started going south at the end, at the kind of beginning of turn three for me. Uh, that's when, like the second turn, I lost two large units to Malay fights. Yeah. And uh, I I was ready to to keep fighting. Uh, with it, uh, because it all you all your units had a bunch of fatigue on them. No, nobody was loaded, so I thought, oh, this is the opening I need to push in. <laughs> and then I got cleaned up a bunch of fatigue with cannon ship that uh, third turn, and then I was able to counter strike with that clutch move with the civilians. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that killed Church and mm -hmm. all the Indian fighters, which were kind of your best unit. 
Let's no. talk about those civilians. They were amazing in this battle. A little of iron. They yeah. Never, they kept succeeding I, save tests and their fatigue checks. They were amazing. They were great <laughs> with thrown weapons. This was the... You gave civilians an upgrade. <laughs> and again, uh, the New England uh, tribes, they gave everyone thrown weapons. Yep. You could buy them or they get them for free. So they had them. Yeah, if they don't aren't an option on their, their stack card, right. then they get them for free. And... Let me tell you, you got a lot of use over those civilians with tomahawks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> now, especially being really, uh, really pushing them forward, uh, pushing with them, having them run forward and do. You'd even charge twice with one of when you knew civilians. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> pushed them to their limit. <laughs> yeah, you did. I I really thought I was going to come out of it okay because on at the end of the fourth turn. I had my commander that uh, he passed all of his fatigue checks. Yeah, six fatigue on them six times, <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is the this is my chance. But uh, the next turn, he was only, he was not able to finish off the. Civilians. Well, I lost my commander on turn four too. Yeah, so that yeah. Was, I lost all that flexibility there. from Josiah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, but then you weren't able to get out of melee, mm -hmm. so he wasn't able to use his other command point, and then I was able to charge him. And yeah, and then after that, I pretty much had no one left. And I took, so at the, at the end of the turn, end of turn five, I had two strikes for deaths. You had two strikes. I had three. Three strikes for From death. casualties, yeah. And then since I had taken your local guide, the traitor's injured, yep. and they showed you the gap in my wall, <laughs> I captured him, which gives you a, a third, a fourth strike. For a fourth strike point. And since the commanders were both dead, you couldn't roll for a strike. Yeah, test. and my officer was dead. Yeah, that's right. Long dead. <laughs> that was a good game. Yeah, it was a game where most of it was uh, melee. We kind of uh, made a mistake earlier on turn two. Of, or at the end of turn two, we kind of remembered that he his commander gets free rallies and a free move because half Four. of the board counts as a fortification. Yeah, I, if you have fortifications, if you're in a fortification, you get that free rally or a free move. So that would have helped me <clears throat> hold up to the initial onslaught. But once I remembered that, I was able to get my force back in shape and resist the colonizers. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. I encourage you to pick up the Fire on the Frontier and try the scenario. It can be a uh, fun battle. It takes a good bit of Indians and English models. You can scale it up or down, but. Um, you only need one palisade set. That's right. You can do it with one palisade set and a blockhouse, um, and trees, and good to go. Yeah, and then, as always, keep your dice ready and the window your back. In your back. <laughs> and the air is <laughs> <in>. Yeah. <laughs>